Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. On this episode, I spoke with Jenny Schaefer. I've known Jenny a really long time. When we met, she was um, she was here in Nashville. I was at a party, and she was beginning her journey of recovery from her eating disorders. Um, she graduated summa cum laude from Texas A&M University with a degree in biochemistry and headed to medical school when she decided instead to move to Nashville to pursue singing and songwriting. It was in Nashville, as I said, that she began to deal with the eating disorders that nearly derailed everything. Fully recovered now, she's an advocate, speaker, consultant, and coach. Her first book, Life Without Ed, How One Woman Declared Independence from Her Eating Disorder and How You Can Too, became a bestseller, and she continues to help countless men and women in their journey to recovery from their eating disorders. Her follow-up book, Goodbye Ed, Hello Me, Recover from Your Eating Disorders, and Fall in Love with Life, came out um, and widened her message to one of self-actualization and personal fulfillment. Her latest book, Almost Anorexic, Is My or My Loved One's Relationship with Food a Problem, addresses the millions of people who struggle with disordered eating while not meeting the diagnostic criteria for a full-blown eating disorder. She recently joined Eating Recovery Center as a national recovery advocate of the Family Institute, and Jenny is chair of the Ambassadors Council of the National Eating Disorders Association. She's very kick-ass, is what I'm trying to say. Um, She's a bright light in the world. She's trying to help and is helping many, 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 many people with these issues. Um, We didn't just talk about eating disorders. We talked about life in general and and the struggle of just navigating daily world and type A personalities and empath personalities and and how all of us are affected by food. Even, Even those of us who don't have an eating disorder, the messaging that we're being given about food and self-love and beauty and all that stuff. We talk about all these things. Um, She gave me a couple great links, which I put on heyhumanpodcast.com. And a phone number, if you or someone you know uh, might be struggling with eating disorder, the phone number 877-957-6575. You can also go to eatingrecovery.com. Um, and of course, Jenny's website, jennyshafer.com, and it's J E N N I S C H A E F E R.com. <clears throat> um, I really, I mean, this is a really empowering conversation in general, I felt like. Um, I love Jenny anyway. I mean, she's a great woman, and I love her message and her passion. And. I just, I think it's great that she's out there touching the world and, and helping people. And I'm really thrilled that she agreed to be on the show. Um, I think y'all are going to like this episode, regardless if you have an eating disorder or not, or have issues with food or not. Um, just the stuff we talked about was really interesting. Um, as usual, like I said, heyhumanpodcast.com is going to have a bunch of links for this episode, um, I think more than usual, I had a lot of links up there. Jenny provided me with a lot of really great information to share with all of you. Um, hey Human, of course, is on iTunes. If you could take a moment, rate, review it. If you're enjoying it, take take the time to, to tell people why you like it. Um, heck, I'm a fair person. If you don't like it, you can take the time to say why you don't like it. Um, I prefer it if you didn't, but you know, you gotta say what you gotta say. Gotta live your truth. Um, Hey Human is on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter under Hey Human Podcast. And, uh, it's on a lot of the podcast applications for your phone and such. Um, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Blurby, um, Podbean, which is for Android phones. And I just learned of a whole bunch of new podcast apps. So I'm going to get Hey Human out on those as well. So I'll keep you posted on that. But of course, as I always say, if you're listening to this already, you figured out where to find Hey Human. Uh, I think that's that's all I got as far as that goes. Um, Thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. 
and enjoy. Hi, Jenny Schaefer. Hello, it's so good to talk to you. I I'm, miss you. I miss I, Nashville. I know. It's so good to see you. Thank you for being on Hey Human Podcast. Oh, yeah. I love it. I've been listening to your shows. You're awesome. I love this show. It's great. Thank you very much. So you and I met years ago in Nashville, and, and now you live in Austin. Yep. Yeah. I love it here, too. Two great music cities. I'm going to definitely come visit you because I haven't been to Austin forever, and I love it there. Oh, yeah. Austin's and it's an incredible city. We yeah. spend a lot of time outdoors here. We're big on outdoors. Yeah. Is there a lot of hiking and stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I live really close to the river downtown. There's hiking trails everywhere, bike trails everywhere. Pretty much every restaurant has a, an outside patio. We kind of like to live outside in Austin, despite the heat. It does get hot here. I remember living in Nashville, and people would think it was hot in Nashville, but man, compared to to Austin, it's not too hot in Nashville. Is it humid, humid or is though. it a dry heat? We're pretty humid in Austin, too, but maybe Nashville's probably more humid, though. Yeah. But I love them both. I feel like I've lived in two great, amazing cities. I'm, they're just both incredible places. I feel like I have two homes, essentially. You know me. I, when I go to Nashville, I go there and visit for quite a long time. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Luckily, I have friends that let me stay and live in their houses. So. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. Been... Well, I'm packing a sleeping bag and driving your direction. <laughs> yeah, come on out, man. Come on out. We'd love to have you. We need. It's a creative city. We need We need more people like you. Yeah, it would be incredible. Um, so let's, let's get down to it. I mean, uh, you, first of all, um, you are an author and a performing songwriter, both. Yes. Um, and, but the, the, the big push of your life, the, the thing that you do, is you're an advocate for eating disorder uh, advocacy. Or like, um, like, how would I say it? Like, uh, you advocate people getting recovered from eating disorders. Right, right. Yeah, that's a complicated like, that's way great, to say that. <laughs> that's a great way to say it. I mean, basically, I, I write and I write about mental health. You know, and first it was eating disorders, and most of my work has been in that. And three books have been released about eating disorders, did all my book signings in Nashville, which was really cool. But I'm working on a new book now actually about post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's my new advocacy. But really, you know, any mental health, but again, it has been mostly an eating disorder so far and just recently more in PTSD. I love it. It's it's pretty cool to get to write about your crazies. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Essentially, so I write about, you can... you know, I write about tr troubles and I'm able to, to really relate to readers. And it's been cool for me to share experiences that I thought I was the only one that had and then I'll get emails or Facebook messages or tweets, you know, that say, wow, me too. And so that's what's really cool about my job is yeah. I get to connect with people one on one, which is pretty awesome. So you have... kind of what you're doing with the podcast. Yeah, well, absolutely. So you have Goodbye Ed, Hello Me, Life Without Ed, Almost Anorexic, and then you're yes, working on, it. is there a new working title for the PTSD book? You know, there's not really a working title yet. It's sort of up in the air. My books are like babies. This one is forming slowly. <laughs> it's it's kind of in the birthing process, so I don't I don't know what it's going to be yet. But it it'll definitely cover PTSD, dating related to that, all kinds of issues related to PTSD. As you know, when I lived in Nashville, I had a lot of uh, what I used to call dating problems. I but... loved hearing your dating stories. They were <laughs> unlike any other, for sure. They were, yeah, pretty interesting. And I, at the time, I thought I was just really bad at dating. But now I know I actually was really sick with PTSD. So I create PTSD kind of, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, for those who don't know, it creates a lot of drama in your life. Really, it can, just like any mental illness can. But it was creating drama in my life around dating. So I thought it was... You know, I was just born kind of crazy, uh, really bad at dating, but now I know there was like a reason for it. And, you know, you can get better. I went to help. I went and got treatment. Now I'm back in the dating world and doing it differently this time. So stay tuned. We'll yeah. maybe do, we well, can do a post. Dating in its own right can cause PTSD. It's, oh, no, totally. It's actually, super I hear stressful. From, I hear from people all the time who say that. It's true, actually. It really is. In some way, we do take you know, little traumas or big ones from each relationship into the next. And we hopefully learn from them and don't keep perpetuating all of it. But, you know, until we're aware and open our eyes, we do kind of can tend to attract the same people. I mean, my my PTSD essentially chose everyone I was dating. So that wasn't good. And when I was with my eating disorder, you know, my eating disorder would, would choose whether or not I was allowed to date. And of course, with the eating disorder, it was more about isolation, you know, just stick to yourself. You don't need anyone. And PTSD was like that on some level too, but it was, it's really hard with, with both of those challenges. Connecting with people is really hard. So actually when I met you, I was in a phase 
of trying to like make new friends as an adult. So I was like in my thirties, but my twenties, I'd struggled with an eating disorder for so long and, and really didn't have many connections because the illness just wants you to be alone. And then when I met you, it was actually my time in life of like getting out and like making friends again, which is harder, you know, as an adult, but, but I was lucky because I fell into a group, you guys, you, Dave Berg and all yeah. those great guys in all Nashville. So I was really lucky to, but you didn't realize, I mean, you were like a pivotal point in my recovery, essentially, oh. of my after recovery, like my, you know, the second stage recovery I, from eating disorders, you might say. So when I met you, I wasn't, I didn't have an eating disorder, but I was still trying to put my life together after the eating disorder. Now, was my dad with me when we met or was that, did that come later? Oh, actually it came later. I love your dad. Yeah. Oh, he's, how is he? He's doing really well. Yeah, he's great. You have a great, yeah, he's great. You're, you're, you guys, your family, I love listening to your podcast and how you talk about your conversations with your dad. Yeah. It's really, I would love to just chill out with your dad for a couple hours and just talk. Oh, it'd be fun to get him to Austin, but he doesn't really fly anymore because, you know, curmudgeon and it's not comfortable. Yeah. I want to run down a little bit of your um, bio for people that don't know um, that just uh, really quickly, you, um, all right, so I have National Recovery Advocate, Chair of Ambassadors Council of the National Eating Disorders Association. That's a mouthful. You yeah. have <laughs> multiple awards for your activism and advocacy. You've been on Entertainment Tonight, Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, Today Show. You have articles in Glamour and Shape, Chicago Tribune. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And obviously an accomplished author, and not only for your own books, but you've contributed to Chicken Soup for the Soul. Yeah, yeah, I've been pretty lucky and grateful in my life to have all these and opportunities. And you travel, right, all over the oh, yeah, country yeah. and perhaps the world? Am I right I love that? it. Actually, I'm starting to do the world. Um, I have been to Canada a lot, if that counts as the world. But I, I, I this this year, this year I get to go. Actually, next month, I'm so excited. I have my first speaking engagement in Europe. I'm speaking in Prague. And I have spoken in Japan, which is awesome. I did that a couple years ago. My first book was released in Japan, and that's been an amazing experience to learn about the Japanese culture. And and I actually had to rewrite my forward for that. So I guess you could say international if you count Japan, Canada, and and, and get my my no, newest in uh, getting to go to Prague. Yeah, I would count Excited. all those for sure. So let's let's go back to the very beginning, as they say. Um, and you, as a small child, um, and. Just talk about what you were like as a little kid, first of all, because I think, um, well, for what we'll get to is the fact that, and as you have said on many occasions, that people confuse what eating disorders actually mean. They think it's food focused, and in fact, it's it's uh, there's a whole other thing going on. So let's go back to your childhood, yeah, yeah. if we may, and. No, that's smart because, I mean, that's where really a lot of an eating disorder stems from our personality traits. So essentially kind of what we're born with. So 50 to 80 percent of actually eating disorder risk factors are heritable and genetic. So when I was born into the world, 50 to 80 percent of my risk of developing eating disorder was already in place. So that's not counting, you know, society, the thin ideal and all that stuff. That's just my genetics. So traits that I was born with that I saw at a really young age were things like perfectionism. I also struggled with high anxiety at a super young age. So my mom, even today, like she'll tell me stories of how anxious I was, and I, I, I can I can believe it because I still have that anxious brain. I've actually I've learned luckily how to deal with it. But when I was three and two years old, even my mom said they couldn't discipline me because say for instance I was about to touch like a hot stove accidentally. You know, my mom might yell, Jenny, don't touch that. But, well, she would yell at me, so I would think, oh my gosh, my mom's yelling at me, and it would hurt my feelings. And she would say like, Jenny. It, you know, it was just the stove. You're not in trouble. But I would get so shaken up. I couldn't I couldn't relate to the fact that I wasn't in trouble. I would get so stuck in the anxiety that I'd make myself sick. I'd actually throw up. So at two and three years old, I was throwing up due, due to high anxiety. I mean, mm. a child that young, that's really sad when I look at it. You know, I, sh I should have been playing with toys and not, you know, being so anxious. But that was just my temperament. And so I was a super anxious kid, a, a very highly sensitive. I remember in Texas, we used to play this game did you guys do this growing up like kids would like sit on balloons and pop them yeah I remember that okay I did not think that was fun at all like everyone like loved that game it felt like every year when I was five or something everyone wanted to play that so I was the kid that w would go into the other room with like the parent of the birthday party and like sit there with the mom while all the kids pop balloons because I would be so overwhelmed by the the stimulation of the loud noise so, so just like Highly sensitive. <laughs> when you're saying that um, that the 50 to 80 percent 
of the eating disorder issue is genetic, you mean because the, the, of a child is high anxiety or, or high expectation on themselves or whatever, that's the component that's the genetic? Or are you saying that the eating disorder itself has a genetic component? Or one well, feeds to the other? Well, that's a good, great question. We're actually learning more and more research in the field. We don't think there's an eating disorder gene for, to say, but we, we do know there's these different traits that you can inherit that make you more vulnerable. So what researchers often say is with eating disorders, genetics loads the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. So genetics can load the gun. So say I was loaded gun with 80% risk factor. Well, the other 20% for me was being in the culture that you know glorifies the thin ideal. But for different people, it's different combinations. That doesn't mean that everybody who's loaded with those genes is going to develop an eating disorder because they don't. But but the the more traits you have, the more vulnerable you could be. So what I like to talk about, like if there's parents listening, you know, it's it's maybe your child who's more the highly sensitive child, the highly anxious child, the perfectionistic child who runs to make all A's. I mean, that can be that could be a child that you might be more concerned about if they started showing signs that they wanted to diet or over exercise, and you know, really get on it and and deal with it right up front. Where you might have another child who's you know, more easygoing, not so anxious. And maybe they try to go on a diet and, and they'll just kind of grow out of it because they they don't like it. They just move on. But the anxious child starts restricting food and realizes, oh, wow, like now my anxiety goes down. And in fact, there's research that shows that for those of us who had anorexia, when we actually restricts food, it decreases our anxiety. So if your anxious child goes on a diet because her 10 year old friend is, and the anxiety starts to feel better. Well, yeah, she's going to stay on the diet. So, you know, 98% of diets fail. Well, people with anorexia, we don't fail on the diet because with our our brains, we actually feel less anxious by not eating. Where there's other people, it can go the other way, right? There's people who get really anxious and then you eat. And it, it's all it's all a big mixed bag though because 50% of people with anorexia ultimately will start binging and purging so you know I started off restricting and then ended up binging so I went all all ways but but all that to say you know I want to make clear I don't dieting I definitely am against dieting dieting is is bad but but you can you know look at your kids and really look at their genetics and and look at what the the anxious one child is more likely to develop an eating disorder yeah it's very it's very interesting what I know you can't speak for all people who have had an eating disorder. Um, and I should also mention at the onset that you were now recovered from. That. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very important. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, important thing to know. But, <laughs> it took um, forever. I recovered in Nashville. Nashville is a special place to me because of that. Oh, wow. So yeah. uh, why do you think personally the limiting of food or maybe there's science behind it? And I know you have a degree in biochemistry, right? Which I assume yeah. has probably helped you do a lot of this writing. but. What is it about restricting the food that brings the anxious level down, do you think? You know, actually, we, we wrote, about, wrote about that in my last book a little bit, Almost Anorexic, but my my friend, Dr. Walter Kay, I'd actually encourage people to Google him. He's done a lot of research on this, but I don't know the exact mechanism. He's he's the eating disorder guru, but, but we're th- finding it has some, it has something to do with like the serotonin system. Mm-hmm. There's also dopamine systems. We're, we're learning all kinds of new stuff with eating disorder research. In fact, they're even finding that gut flora might have something to do with eating disorder development, but we're really on the cusp of really kind of figuring all this stuff out. But I would encourage people, I mean, there are a lot of great researchers out there and like Walt K is one of them if, if you guys google his name you'll come up with all kinds of well, great I'll put, I always put links I'm gonna shut this door that I always forget to close when I'm doing these but, um I'll and Cindy Bulick is another one I'll put li- what's what's the name Cynth- Cynthia Bulick she out of North Carolina does a lot of great work and I, I work with Eating Recovery Center as a national recovery advocate. Our website, eatingrecovery.com, has a ton of great information as well. But, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you're doing this podcast because people st- out there still don't really know about eating disorders as much as I wish the general public did. Well, there, I feel that there is so much stigma around food in general, image in general, and then people with the eating disorders, I think there's a lot of stigma attached to that and very little understanding as to why. And there's that that sort of offhanded, like, well, why don't people just start eating or why don't they stop eating or why don't... And it's not an eating disorder from my understanding. It's not just restriction of food or eating and then throwing up, but it's also overeating and, you know, there's all these rules and regulations that a person might yeah. put on themselves. Oh, yeah. I mean, great point. In fact, 
just in 2013, when this new diagnostic manual came out, binge eating disorder was officially recognized finally as a disorder, an eating disorder. And of course it is, and it's been an eating disorder for a long time. It's just kind of funny. There's a book with a, called the DSM, Diagnosis, and nothing's official technically until it's in that book. But of course you and I know it's it exists long before it exists in the book. But, but binge eating disorder is a huge problem in our country. In fact, it's the most common eating disorder. So that would be binging without compensating for it, where bulimia is more binging and then compensating for it in some way, whether it's over-exercising, fasting, throwing up. And of course, anorexia, for those listening who don't know, that's more of the restrictive type eating disorder. But there's, you know, our last book, Almost Anorexic, is all about just forget about the labels for for a minute or forever. That's not really what matters. You know, I for so long remember being in Nashville and I knew I had troubles with food, but I would read these brochures on eating disorders and I would never seem to fit into the categories. Like I didn't think I was, you know, anorexic enough or I didn't struggle with bulimia enough to fit into that category. So I thought, well, I don't deserve help. But what my message is, is really, you know, if you're listening to this and you struggle with food on any level where you know, you're miserable because of food. Your life's unmanageable because of food. It doesn't matter what you're doing with food or your attitude toward it, but but get help. It, so we try to steer away from, you know, it's not about the behaviors. It's about how is your life, how is your life doing because of your relationship with food? And I don't care what you're doing with food or what you're not doing. If your relationship with food is impacting your life, you deserve help because it doesn't have to. I mean, food should just be food. <laughs> That's what I essentially learned. You know, it's fuel for life. That's really what it is. And of course, in our society, we celebrate with food and, you know, at every party there's food. So that's part of our society. But but in my life, food finally is no longer in control of me. I mean, for so many years, food was what I thought about constantly. And like what you said, though, it's so ironic because it's, it's a paradox. It's an eating disorder is totally about food and weight, and then it's totally not about food and weight at the same time. Because it's a really about those underlying issues like constant self-criticism, painful, unrelenting perfectionism, high anxiety, different things for different people. Underneath some eating disorders is trauma, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people struggle with substance abuse at the same time. But the eating disorder really is kind of a way to cope with life. So actually in, in AA meetings, you'll hear people say, I don't have a drinking problem. I had a living problem. So often I would say, you know, I, I never had an eating problem. It was actually my solution eating, you know, I had a living problem and that's really, you know, what, what we have to learn in recovery. It's not just learning to eat again. It's learning how to recover our life again and how to live again, right. how to live without using food as a drug essentially. So when you were a little girl and you began that journey uh, into your eating disorder, how did it how did it play out? What what happened exactly that led you down that path? Yeah, you know, well, my eating disorder crept in slowly over time. I mean, I remember being four years old and already being in dance class and looking in a wall to wall mirror and and looking at myself and comparing myself to other girls and thinking I'm fat. Now, there's no photographic evidence that I was ever an overweight child. I was always just kind of a normal average size. But for, to me, I always looked in the mirror and saw bigger than I really was. And I compared to people. And so already at four years old, I had this negative body image. And what we've noticed with eating disorders is that negative body image for many people tends to be the first part of the eating disorder to kind of creep up. So the first part you might see but I didn't tell anyone about that, so that just stayed in my head. But slowly, with negative body image, it's probably pretty intuitive. It makes sense that someone eventually would start maybe restricting food because of that, you know, or doing something with food. So for me, I started restricting food in, even in elementary school and middle school. And by the time I was in high school, I started binging. By the time I was in college, I was binging and purging and restricting, and, and I would have definitely been – classified, you know, as anorexia nervosa binge purge type, if you want to use that book I told you about. But again, I like to get away from those and just say, my life was unman unmanageable. I was miserable. Now, if you looked at me, I had straight A's and was a biochemistry degree going to med school. And it looked like I had it all together. And that's a real trick of eating disorders is many times people are highly functioning, very smart people. In fact, there's research that shows eating disorders, people with eating disorders have higher IQ than the average person. So these are really smart people that can highly function for a long time. So, 
they might be your, you know, just your attorneys, your doctors, your leaders in your city, the people you admire most, your amazing moms, whatever it is, someone who's super high achieving in whatever they do. Mm -hmm. And until they're not, I mean, what happens for many of us is we we reach a point where eventually we can't do that anymore. And that's when I got help. But what I would want people who listen to you, you know, to, to do is don't wait till, you know, your life is totally, completely hitting rock bottom you don't have to wait that long. You know, get help now. Do you Sooner feel you like help, people noticed better. that you had an issue? Was there was there people saying to you like, "Hey, why are you not eating your dinner?" or "What are you doing in the oh, bathroom yeah. for so long?" or you know? Yeah, well, you know, for the longest time, no one noticed because I looked normal. Okay, so that's the biggest reason no one said anything is because people tend to think that an eating disorder looks a certain way, like a certain size when re- really an eating disorder can be any size and shape as you and I know. But, but so for the longest time with my eating disorder, I actually, if you looked at me visually, I was a healthy size. I was a normal size. No one would have thought I was too thin at all. But so no one said anything for the longest time. And the truth is I ate normally in front of everyone. So at home, my family would have dinner at five o'clock. I actually have a great family. You know, we would eat dinner at five and I would eat dinner with them. But they didn't know what happened afterwards in my bedroom where I would freak out about all that I'd eaten. And then the next day I'm already calculating, well, if I ate this for dinner, well, I can't eat breakfast tomorrow and I can't eat lunch at school. And, you know, people who might have noticed but who didn't say anything were my show choir. I was in show choir back when it wasn't cool, <laughs> um, back before for uh, is it glee the big popular show yeah, yeah. yeah back when i was in show choir it was it was not cool to be in it but i was still in it um but we had i had that during fourth period which was like lunchtime and and my choir team could see that i wasn't eating lunch but they never said anything because so many of the people in this class didn't eat lunch either it was just like a cool thing to do to to not eat mm-hmm. but when i went to college is the first time anybody said anything to me and that's because my first year in college i actually lost a lot of weight so visually i started fitting into what stereotypically people think an eating disorder looks like and so my high school friends were who had seen me grow up through the years they were concerned about me and were saying things like are you do you have an eating disorder are you anorexic but my college friends so the new people who i was just meeting in school they actually were coming at me saying, you look great. How do you stay so thin? I wish I could be like you. So here I was getting compliments on one hand for having really an an illness. Anorexia has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric illness. So I'm getting like complimented for it. And then on the other hand, my high school friends are worried about me. So it's really one of the few mental illnesses, if you think about it, that people actually get complimented for over and over again. I mean, if you think about it, your friends who maybe struggled with alcoholism, I have a lot who did, tons of recovered alcoholics I have great, great friends, and they'll tell their stories, and you know, there was no one complimenting them when they didn't show up at work or had a hangover the next day. But with eating disorders, wow, you can get complimented for some of the symptoms, yeah. just depending on what your struggle is. But I actually did go to a college doctor at the time and, and said to her, I listed off eating disorder criteria. I said, I, I'm having trouble, you know, um, I said I'm over, I actually described a binging. I said I'm eating a lot sometimes in a short amounts of time and just uncontrollable. And I had told her I hadn't had a period, so menstruation in many months, and that can be a sign for women with eating disorders. And I told her I'd lost a lot of weight in a short amount of time. And she actually said one question. She said, well, do you eat? And people with eating disorders do eat. So I said, yes, as I described, I had binges. And she said, well, you're fine. You're just walking a lot. It's a big campus. You're stressed out. And I did not walk into another office for five years until I was in Nashville, Tennessee. Wow. So that's where our doctors are really missing the boat. A lot of them are. A lot of We really need to teach our pediatricians, our general care doctors, primary care. Unfortunately, in medical school, they don't, they get about one or two hours as in like, you know, a Monday from two to three, like on eating disorders. So we need to do more education so people know what to look for. And again, it's not just the weight. It's, it's, it's many, many other things. And it may be that you went into a person who had their own disorder and you were mirroring to them and they didn't like that. And you know what I mean? Oh, true. Oh, true, true. No, for sure that happens. And interestingly enough, de- my brother's actually a dentist. I spoke to his dental class, but dentists are often the first people who spot eating disorders because the teeth. The teeth, yeah. So Explain with bulimia, about that a little bit. So with bulimia, you can you can, from throwing up, you can actually have acid erode your teeth. And so dentists will often see with people who struggle with purging, they'll actually see teeth really rotting and so, and decaying. And and I've seen people with, with really 
really difficult struggles with their teeth, but they but you can again, I mean, you can go to you can get the stuff. This stuff gets better. You know, maybe you're never going to have perfect teeth, but you can go to a dentist and 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 get better teeth. You know, the the main point I like to share is, you know, once you get help, you can change these things. You can reverse a lot of the stuff. Yeah. I used to have osteoporosis, weakening of the bones at like 22. I'm now, you know, 41 and I don't have it anymore. It went away because I started eating right. So anyone who is struggling and is, who's listening, you know, hold on to hope that even if you have some of this, these physical effects, you can reverse them and things can get better. Yeah. And you can definitely overcome the mindset of our culture that we live in that really has an eating disorder in and of itself. I totally agree with that. I remember being a kid and my mother, um, growing up, my mother was tended to be overweight and she was a binge eater for sure and my father was you know thin as a rail and they would have their own little they're still married after all these years but they would have their own little (laughs) conversations that I would overhear and I just I remember moments of you know reaching for something at dinner and one of my parents saying something to the effect of like oh are you sure you want to eat that or oh that has too much sugar or even earlier um, before we started this I was talking to my dad on the phone, and as you know, my dad's a great guy, but I don't think people really realize what they say sometimes, and I was making my lunch, and um, I was like, oh, I'm just going to make my lunch before the podcast, and I'll eat it afterwards, so I'm just munching on a cookie. He's like, a cookie? You shouldn't be eating that, all that sugar and calories and all this stuff, and I started laughing. I said, Dad, you are the king of irony today. I said, the person I'm talking to, and then I explained, you know, that he knows you, you know, so he's like, oh, okay, and he said, well, isn't that interesting, but it's just funny because these little things that people around us say, oh, yeah, creep in. Oh, yeah, so definitely, I mean, I grew up, I remember my dance teacher growing up telling us, many different dance teachers said, you know, things about cookies, and I remember when I was like 12, our dance teacher said us down and said, you guys are all about to go through puberty. You have to watch out. Your hips are going to get bigger. And I mean, for me, again, thinking back the highly anxious, highly perfectionistic, highly sensitive kid who takes everything to heart, I took that and ran with it and it helped fuel my eating disorder. But there were other little girls in the class and it was, it was all girls in that class at the time that they could hear that and they just kind of blew it off, you know, but I didn't have the temperament to blow that off. Yeah. I, I took everything real seriously. Actually, you might remember our, all my, all our friends in Nashville say I, I'm very gullible. I believe I tend to believe stuff, but I take a lot of things to heart, which, you know, it's not a bad thing. And what we talk about with eating disorder recovery is, you know, some of these traits, they're not necessarily bad. You can learn how to tailor these traits so that they're actually helpful. I like to say, you know, high anxiety makes me highly creative. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> my, my anxious brain can, can think in all kinds of imaginative ways that other people can. And sometimes it's not helpful if I'm thinking of all kinds of things that aren't, you know, anxiety in a ne- negative way. But if I use that, that fuel of the anxiety and turn it into high energy, highly creative, it can help me write a book, you know. So, yeah. again, just hope for people, just because you're born with these temperaments, so first of all, it doesn't mean you're going to have an eating disorder. But second of all, it doesn't mean your life's going to be miserable. These traits are actually pretty good. In fact, perfectionism, you know, it's not good when you use it to drive yourself into the ground and, you know, be miserable. But perfectionism is good if you take harness it for the positive and it makes you detail-oriented and motivated, you know. Mm-hmm. That, so it's I've had to learn in my life how to really tailor these traits, how to use them for good and not bad. And it's, it's a constant struggle. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm recovered from my eating disorder, but I am not recovered from life. You know, I, I'm constantly every day, you know, I work on different things. I, yeah. I wish I could figure it all out. I think with your, maybe with your podcast, you'll figure us humans out eventually. Well, it's certainly <laughs> a goal, but I don't know that that's, you know. That'd be amazing. <laughs> I always joke I mean, that I do this so I can report back to the aliens everything I've learned. No, it's <laughs> true. I mean. <laughs> well, you're, you have the most, I have to say you have the most diverse podcast I've ever heard. I think it's amazing. Well, I love you. it. I love how you can just hear any, I mean, so many different topics. I was on an airplane yesterday. I had so much fun. Like, I downloaded some of your episodes before the plane started. <laughs> That's awesome. Yay. Well, I'm so glad. Um, I, I want to touch on the fact that I think a lot of people think that only women are have eating disorder issues. And oh, I know yeah. That that's certainly not the case. There was a boy in my high school who struggled uh, with anorexia, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's been a myth. And unfortunately, people still think that. But but yeah, I mean, apps, there's millions of men out there who struggle with eating disorders. And and it's every eating disorder, like you said, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder. Uh, OSFED is another name of an eating disorder. Other specified feeding and eating disorder. You know, the names go on and on. But 
but yeah, men struggle too. And more men get help gratefully these days. My friend, Brian Cuban has written some books. You might want to include his website up there. Um, He's really gotten the word out about men and eating disorders. And just this morning, actually, before we talked, I was talking on the phone with a man in his 40s who is finally getting help for an eating disorder that he struggled with his whole life. So, I mean, that's why I do what I do is to talk to people like that. And this poor guy, I mean, he was so ready to change. And and he said it was really hard because in his treatment he had done before for some other mental health issues, nobody thought he could have an eating disorder but because he was a male. I mean, he actually ran into that. But he does have an eating disorder. He's 44, very successful. This is a person who is super successful. And, you know, they struggle with an eating disorder. So, yeah, there's anybody can have an eating disorder. You can't tell by looking. You just cannot tell. So when you went into that office and that woman basically shoo-shooed you away when you were in college, what was the impetus to have you want to change? Where, where did you decide, oh, wait a minute, there's something going on here that I need to fix? How did you have that moment? Yeah, I mean, I remember the moment, really. My last semester, so I went and saw that doctor my first semester of college. My last semester of college, I remember the first time my binging was getting so bad that I was getting so desperate that I started for the first time making my trying to make myself throw up. And I remember being in the bathroom of my little dorm, like it wasn't a dorm at that, it was a little apartment I had and trying to make myself throw up. And that was honestly, Susan, like the first time in my life where I heard the light bulb went on and it was like, wait, this isn't right. Like, cause I had seen, there was some movie, like when we grew up, was it Meredith Baxter, Bernie did oh, the TV that. show on, yeah. on bulimia. And I remember her making herself throw up and I was like, Oh wait, you know, that's bulimia. That's an eating disorder. Maybe I have a problem, but I had a problem for so many years before. Why hadn't I had that red flag? And I think that speaks to what the media really does teach us. I mean, that movie, because she binged and purged, I saw the throwing up part as an eating disorder, but I didn't see the restricting I had done for so long, the loss of weight that I was getting complimented for, you know, mm-hmm. so that didn't make their, yell- their little flags go off in my head. But I still didn't get help then, though. I mean, what you find is people, they have the light bulbs go off and they realize there's a problem. But what many of us do is we say, well, we're going to fix it ourselves. And like I said, many of us are high functioning. So we think we can because, you know, we make straight A's or whatever it is. And and I thought, well, I'm just going to stop doing this. You know, I'll start tomorrow. <laughs> and how many people, I don't know if you know a lot of people in recovery. I think you do, actually. But, you know, we when we're in that phase of I'll start tomorrow, we're not getting better. And I tried for many years to get better on my own. Um, I moved to Nashville. It probably took a couple more years where I finally got help. And I got help in Nashville because I moved to Nashville like everybody else to sing, right? And, and I moved there and I couldn't sing at all. In fact, I actually had really bad vocal problems. I had to go to the Vanderbilt Boys Clinic because my eating disorder was affecting my vocal cords. So, I mean, it causes – an eating disorder affects the, tip, the hair on your head to your tips of your toes and everything in between because it's food. You know, it's, your, it's what we live off of. But so I went to Nashville and I was trying to wait tables. I got some great advice from, you know, Robert Earl Keane. Yeah. <laughs> he um, went to my college, Texas A&M, and I wrote him a letter and said, hey, I'm, I'm not going to go to medical school. Instead, I'm going to go to Nashville and be a singer. Do you have any advice? And he wrote me a letter back. I was so excited. It's still hanging on my refrigerator at home. <laughs> and he said, um, if you want to be a singer in Nashville, here's what you got to do. Get a job waiting tables and sing as much as you can at night. And so that's what I did. But I couldn't do it. That You know, that's what I tried to do. But my eating disorder kept me where I couldn't sing at night. I couldn't even hold my job waiting tables, you know, and it was so hard, especially, of course, you know, waiting tables wasn't exactly the best job for someone with an eating disorder. Mm, I find that very ironic. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I mean, and you know how it's it often happens that that's the case. I mean, you don't know how many friends I know who are bartenders who are alcoholics, you know, and absolutely. we put ourselves in these situations where we're constantly triggered. And I actually had to quit. Of course, I had to quit that job. I I quit waiting tables and started working in a law firm when I got into recovery. And I became a legal secretary for a while and a paralegal and all kinds of different. I've had a lot of careers, Susan. (laughs) I was a security guard once, too. At the height of my anorexia, I was was a horrible security guard, I'll tell you that. But at at one of the entertainment centers in Nashville. (laughs) But I couldn't really have a gun. You had a carrot. I had nothing. I, we had nothing. They actually gave us these little, these, these uh, neon yellow, like, things we wore over uh, shirts that said security, and that's all we had. <laughs> and the wits that you had about you, yes. <laughs> so, it was just wit. But, yeah, so I finally got help in Nashville when really I couldn't function. And that's, I was, you know, I was 
I couldn't function. I mean, I, to give you an example, I would get disoriented driving in my car, and one time I ended up at my voice teacher's house crying at, you know, two in the morning, not knowing where I was. And I mean, it almost seemed like she used to think I was on drugs. I actually had many people, my manager at work, I used to work at Gibson Cafe, which used to be downtown Broadway, but it's been closed for years now. My manager, I'll never forget at work, actually approached me and thought I was doing drugs because my eyes were so bloodshot. And I just, I, my behavior mirrored that of a drug addict. Well, the brain and, needs food. It's right, you know, and and it needs liquids. It's a you know, it's a highly functioning electronic. Basically, it's it's an oh, electric, yeah. magnetic thing. It's it needs totally. the calorie and it needs the the the, the water to keep. Oh yeah, running. it uses more calories than any other organ. Actually, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I'm when I'm songwriting or writing anything, I, I get so hungry because my brain is working I know. so hard. Yeah. It's true. And now it's so cool when I get hungry, I just eat. I mean, it seems so simple. Like, why did it take me so long to figure it out? You know, I learned in recovery, I eat when I'm hungry, stop when I'm full, but do it in a balanced way. And it's, I can't believe I'm actually saying I can do that now, but that's actually what I do. It's, it's incredible. I, my life changed completely in Nashville. That's, yeah, I mean, thank God. Um, you know, I think a lot about how we humans are about food. I mean, there are places in the world, obviously, where people truly are starving to death and would give anything to be able to eat every day and can't. And then right. in places like America and Europe, where and I, I'm, I'm guessing Japan because Japan's been so influenced by America. Is there a pretty high rate of anorexia and, and bulimia and and problems like that in in Japan and in the? Asia? Oh yeah. Yeah, there's a re- there's a real problem in Japan. What we really see is any westernized culture yeah. tends to have problems. And I just got a request actually to speak, do a Skype interview with some Japanese. It's a Japanese support group. Um, what a big a big struggle there is there's if you think there's a stigma on mental health in America, which there still is, there's even a bigger one in Japan. So I was actually asked by my translator of my book when I wrote a new forward for Life Without Ed, my first book, I was actually asked to, to address that stigma firsthand for Japanese people. So I wrote it in English and then my translator put it into J- Japanese. It's been really cool to work with different different cultures and different countries like that. But but my translator said it's some of the first, it was one of the first books out there in Japan about eating disorders. But I get letters, it's cool. I do get some notes from people in Japan because as you know, you know, a lot of other countries speak English where we don't necessarily speak other people's languages, but wish I could, but so I'll get some letters which is cool. But but a cool an interesting study that you can actually there's a New York Times article that talks about it, but it's the Fiji Island study. And it happened in a, in the late 90s. Ann Becker from Harvard went to Fiji Islands right when they introduced television to Fiji. So this was the shows like Baywatch, um, Melrose, what was it called, Melrose Place or whatever. Um, and Aunt, Dr. Becker thought, well, okay, this island, they have not had TV yet, so this is a perfect chance. Just while they're getting American TV, let me go over there and figure out what happens with the incidence of eating disorders. And what, what they noticed was before TV was influenced or introduced to Fiji Islands, the culture actually wanted to be bigger. So being skinny was actually not a compliment. Um, if you if someone said you have skinny legs, that was not good. You wanted to be bigger. You wanted to be robust because that showed you had food and wealth. You know, So you wanted to be bigger. That was just how the culture was. Three years after TV was introduced, so from 1995 to 1998, three years later, when Dr. Becker went in and went in to see the incidence of eating disorders, 11% of girls were throwing up to lose weight, where the incidence of eating disorders before was was pretty much non-existent. Yeah. So that just speaks to what just what American TV did to some of the kids. It wasn't all of them. Again, so it's not culture doesn't cause eating disorders, but it can contribute. Well, I talk and, about it all the time. We are constantly bombarded in television and magazines and just out and about uh, with the idea that we're not good enough, we're not pretty enough, we're not thin enough, we're not smart enough, our penises aren't hard enough, oh, yeah. you know, our vaginas aren't wet enough, you know, whatever it is. I right, mean, those right. are, you know, whatever. Those are real medical problems, you know. But you know what I'm saying. It's just we're yeah, constantly yeah. being told what we're not. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's how marketing works, right? I mean, sales, they... 
they have, the beauty industry, they have to tell you you look bad, that you need this to be better. So basically the advertising, they have to knock you down to sell the product. Well, not only that, but I, I heard someone say, and I wish I could credit this to the right person. It may have been Joe Rogan. I'm not sure. But, you know, if you're being bombarded with all this stuff to make you feel bad and then the people advertise the mental health pills on the same television... Right, right. I mean, that's a that's a nice closed little circle, isn't it? I'm going to make you yeah. feel like crap, and then I'm going to offer you the pill to make you feel better. And I win both ways because you're going to go buy the stuff that makes you think you look better, and you're going to take the pill that's going to make you feel better. Right. No, you're right. Pretty I mean, we live... Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, we, we definitely, in the, in the eating disorder field, we are trying to change. You know, we are working, trying to change things. We have advocates that watch for like ads that are particularly triggering i mean there's even been you might have seen in the news over the past few years some pictures of models that you know already thin models are being photoshopped to be even thinner and and some magazines are speaking out against that and actually you know really trying to change things and vowing you know yeah. not to use photoshop as much or and hopefully i mean there's some body positive movements you might have seen on Instagram. It's called Bopo, hashtag Bopo. <laughs> I just learned about that. I speak in colleges, so they make me cool sometimes. I know the cool hashtags. <laughs> otherwise, I don't know what's going on on Instagram. But I just got on Instagram. It's pretty fun. But you see these really cool pictures of these women and men posting like their real bodies. You know, they might post them sitting in a chair where they're fat, you know, they have rolls on their stomach. Like I'm sitting here now, I can see rolls on my stomach. You know, that's normal, you know. Yeah, and then you stand and, up and they go away. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. just cool to see this new kind of movement. It's small, it's grassroots, but I think, I mean, I have hope that we will change the culture eventually. I hope it's in our lifetime. I don't know if it will be. You but... go into a bakery, though, for example, um, go into the coffee shop and then you look at the baked goods and it says, guilty pleasure or be bad or oh, yeah. you know and no, all of a sudden it's all this negative connotation it should say be happy you know I this know. is fun tastes good you know no, joy it's true. Well, you make a great point. I mean, how we often use we give moral value to food. So meaning like you said you know, you're like, you'll hear people say, you know, I've been good today. So now I'm going to be bad when they're at a restaurant. And they mean like they've been good because they ate, you know, some broccoli for lunch or whatever. And then they're going to be bad because they're going to eat pizza for dinner or whatever. Right. So we give food this good or bad label, like it has a moral value. But the truth is food is just food. Food, eating food or not eating food doesn't make you a good or bad person. But you made a great point. And if you look at even the names of some of our foods, like angel food cake is light and fluffy, right? Low calorie. So it's angel food cake. But what's devil's food cake? It's hard. It's like dark and, you know, rich and more calories and dense. And so we give it the name devil. You know, even just that is a simple example of how we we put moral values on food when the truth is. Food is just food, and now, I'm not saying that a piece of broccoli it doesn't have more nutritional value than maybe a brownie, right? But what I am saying and what I learned in my recovery is if we practice intuitive eating, which is you know what babies do, eat when we're hungry, stop when we're full, eat what our bodies truly crave, once we get in tune, and it takes it took me years to get in tune with my body, but my body will tell me how much broccoli it wants, and it'll tell me how many brownies it wants, and if I, if I truly listen in balance, I'm going to eat the right amount of broccoli versus brownies. You know what I mean? I, I think yeah. people, we tend to think if we eat brownies, that's all we're going to eat. But that's not true. In fact, we actually at a different, um, at some treatment centers, people will actually do food challenges where I know like a patient who used to think she, if she ate cheesecake, she would eat cheesecake and never stop. So actually at in treatment, she for one day they said, okay, all you're going to eat today is cheesecake. And we're going to give you as much as you want. And you're in this room and you can eat cheesecake all day. And do you think she ate cheesecake all day? No, she got sick of it. You know, so our bodies naturally when we're in a healthy spot, we're, we're going to eat we're going to eat in balance. And, you know, that's what our bodies want. They don't, we don't need these rigid rules because rules just make us binge, honestly. I mean, how many times have you turned down dessert at a restaurant only to go home and, and end up eating a whole cake? You know, I used to do that. Right, and this is also true for people that wouldn't have what would be characterized as an eating disorder, but it does, to me, that whole grander picture of America's eating disorder. Or I remember, and I've told this story before on, on various episodes I, I remember telling it on one of them at least about the guy. I was at the coffee shop and the guy was buying his coffee and I was off to the side waiting for my lunch. And 
at the last minute he said, oh, uh, and he pointed at the muffin thing and he's like, oh, I'll have that muffin. And he looked, he looked so guilty about it. And they stuck the yeah. muffin in the bag and they handed it to him and he held onto it like he was holding plutonium. And then he kind of looked in the bag and I watched his facial expressions and all I could think of is like, man, that is just, that's us. What's what we do? We beat ourselves up for eating a cookie or, you know, or for not eating yeah. the broccoli or, you know, or whatever it is. It's just, it's hard to believe that people can ever let that voice go completely. Yeah. I mean, I used to think that for sure, that it would never go. And what I have learned, I mean, in a way it's those of us who've had eating disorders and actually had the the ability to get treatment for it. I feel like we are given more tools than like the average woman or man is given in our culture. So I spent many years in Nashville going to body image therapy group, you know, every week. And you probably didn't get to do that. You know, I got to go to a dietitian every week and talk about this kind of stuff. Most people in our country don't do that. You don't end up doing that unless you end up with an eating disorder, which I think, I mean, we should teach these concepts to everyone. But because of all that extra work I got to do, I learned all these skills that most people never learn. And so I have gotten to a place where I don't hear that anymore about food. I don't hear my personal eating disorder voice. What I do hear and but what I recognize is what you said, like this societal, I call it societal ed. So in my second book, Goodbye Ed, Hello Me, I named it Societal Ed. So ed, ed if those of you who are wondering who listened, you listened to my book titles, I forgot to tell people, Ed stands for eating disorder. So I learned to kind of personify my eating disorder and call it Ed. But I kind of call that voice that I'll sometimes hear societal ed. So yeah, if I go to a restaurant and I hear this voice that says, you know, no, don't eat the cheesecake. I'm like, I'll actually have awareness. Like, you know what? That's just societal ed. What do I really want right now? And I'll listen to my body. And if it wants the cheesecake, that's what I'll get. And sometimes I don't actually want the cheesecake. Like well, yesterday was my birthday. Um, thanks for Happy the text, birthday. by the way. <laughs> my friend like brought these, this little cool 25 like cupcakes. There are these mini cupcakes, 25 of them from New York city. She, she brought them straight from New York city off the plane to Austin. It was so cool. And she brought them and I wasn't exactly hungry at that time, but just, but I ate a tiny cupcake because it was just there and it was my birthday. You know, that's an example of intuitive eating too. Intuitive eating is flexible like that. You know, sometimes we eat a mini cupcake just cause it's our birthday and we want to have fun. Yeah. And if, if we're balanced like that, we're not going to eat all 25. But in my past with my eating disorder, I would have felt horribly guilty for maybe eating one or and swore not to eat any more and then I'd binge on all of them tomorrow you know but right now they're in my refrigerator I'll probably have one or two later tonight maybe not maybe tomorrow whatever and it, it's just not a big deal anymore and I didn't never think I would say that I mean I remember I wrote a whole chapter in one of my books I think it's life without Ed the weekend with the cake I mean I wrote a whole chapter about a cake that haunted me all weekend <laughs> and food just doesn't have that power over me anymore and and it and people can get that good I mean we do live in a society that tells us that we can never get that to that place but I argue with that and we can get to that place I mean we don't have to live the way we are living looking at food and I've seen people find full freedom from food. And again, it doesn't mean they have perfect body image or anything like that. It means that they have an awareness. You know, I still sometimes look in the mirror and, you know, I'm getting older and I'll notice wrinkles or whatever. And I'll hear a negative body image comment. But then I know, like, that's just a thought. You know, that's what our society says. And I'll be like, you know what? So what? I have smile lines. Okay, that means I smiled a lot, you know? I mean, and I actually remember having a voice years ago say, well, don't, you know, in my head, like, don't smile because you're going to have smile lines. But really, you know, like that's not living. So what I learned is just try to, you know, try to always bring yourself back to like the awareness and just the balance. And it is hard. It's a constant, you know, now what I struggle most with not is not food or body image, but, you know, the anxiety piece, yeah. <laughs> anxiety in my life. That's still there. That was there when I was two. But I, I learned how to cope with it. And, and having friends like you, I mean, you guys taught me a lot in Nashville. Having friends, truly, I mean, there's tons of research on this, but it helps people live longer, you know, I mean, yeah. hanging out with people. And that's one of the things I got to always work on is connecting with people right. and people who love you for you and aren't right, right. No expectations. There's no reciprocity, you know, it's just, I love you because I love you. That's, right. That's as simple as that. It's funny. You bring up about the voice in the head of, you know, what we look like and such. I was once uh, at the gym and I was on the, uh, the stair climber and I noticed the young woman in front of me who had the best butt, and I was looking at her butt, <laughs> and I was thinking, God, if only I had a butt like that. And I, as I was looking at her butt and thinking these thoughts, 
I was I started, you know, moving up to see her face and I saw that she was looking at the girl's butt in front of her. And it <laughs> yeah, made me giggle been. to myself because that's what we do. Instead of looking inside, like, wow, I have this body that, you know, it, it thinks great thoughts and it, it moves through my day and it can drive me to the store or it can walk me around the park or look at a tree or, you know, all these things that... And so now I try and come from a place of, you know, thank you, body. Thank you for getting up this morning. Thank you yeah, for doing this. Yeah, oh, I and, love that. You know, this sort of grace place. Yeah, of, I mean, that's the key. That is the key. Yeah. I mean, in my recovery, I learned... You know, look at your body as a vehicle for life, not something to be controlled. You know, we're taught in society we're supposed to nip and pick and like make our carve our bodies to this perfect shape. But really, you said it beautifully. Our bodies are vehicles to get through the day. I mean, my friend Carolyn Costum calls our bodies our earth suits, which I love. I call them meat sticks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's funny. That's funny. But yeah, I mean, if we can, and I try to think about that too, like. The older I get, especially, I've started noticing, you know, I can't, my eyes are starting to not be as good. I have a little bit of back pain. And I, I noticed, like, wow, I'm so grateful that I can walk and I can, you know, still rock climb and ride my bike and stuff like that. And, and just sit here and, like you said, talk to you. And, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing what gratitude will do. I, we, yeah. we do that a lot with our patients at Eating Recovery Center, focusing on gratitude and, and acceptance and also values. You know, some, a big piece of what we work with patients is on connecting with our values in life. You know, our, if we really go down to our core, is my value to have a perfect body or is my value to help my fellow mankind, mm-hmm. you know? Is my value to have a, be friends and be a loving person or is it to have perfect hair? You know, and all of us really know our true value is not about looking perfect. Our true values are based on like the reason you do this podcast, you know, to help people and, and how can we connect to our true values? And sometimes a helpful exercise is to think about what are, what do you value most in life? The top three things. And then look at your life. Do you do anything that relates? Like if my top value, one of them is, you know, commuting with nature or spiritual practice in nature, how often do I go outside? You know, how, how congruent are we with our values? That's something that in recovery I learned. And again, that's not about food or weight, you know, but that's something that we can use to just live a more balanced life. Yeah. What do you we think have is, all these pressures. I, um, have to be I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that no matter though, for, for myself, I can only speak for myself is that I know better and yet I can still fall into those patterns of, oh man, I should do this and work out this more. Or, oh, my butt's lifting more or whatever it is. And then when I'm in the gym and I lift up a weight that's 25 pounds when, you know, four months ago I could only lift a 15 pound weight, then it shifts and it's like, wow, look what I can do. Yeah, I mean, and that's a cool point because, you know, getting, I actually had to lift weights in my recovery to gain bone mass to fight osteoporosis and and that was a cool feeling when I was getting stronger and actually when I would go to the gym I I actually was trying to gain weight I was actually trying to gain muscle and bone so I was trying to go up on the scale and and there there was a a cool factor in thinking like wow I'm stronger and I actually noticed in putting like my my luggage in the overhead bin in the airplane because I travel so much it started to become easier and it was like so cool to notice that strength but then you know there's also people who get get caught up in compulsive over exercise and I've done that too so you you have to find a balance like you know it's not always that you need to lift five more pounds maybe it's okay that you just lift the same amount you know I mean it's so it's all I mean the key to everything is balance. Is balance right yeah it's so hard it really is hard but it it is possible <laughs> but I mean it's like a, like but like I said you know I'm not I don't live a perfect life I'm always no, we're human. I'm always like we're, I mean, I'm, I'm totally human yeah. totally I think it's interesting too that's like a lot of times people get together and they act out that scene in Jaws you know the scene in Jaws where they're on the boat and they're showing each other their scars only I've been around groups where, you know, we sit there and talk about our flaws. And I think it's just so funny. Now, like, now I'm in a better headspace. But in the past, we'd be like, oh, my God, you know, I wish I had bigger boobs. Or, oh, I wish my legs were longer. Or I wish, you know, people just have their thing. Or, oh, I have this scar and it makes me feel less beautiful. Or, and we just, or you give someone a compliment and their response to the compliment is like, oh, but I blah, 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 blah. And they negate the compliment. We have this weird thing human beings have you know that yeah no I mean it's I just actually spoke in Ohio a couple days ago and 
we were talking about changing the conversation when stuff like that happens. So, I mean, often we all fall into that conversation where our friend will see us or, and the first thing they say is, I, I look horrible today or something, or I hate my jeans, whatever it is, some bad negative body image comment. And, and we talk about in treatment, you know, trying to change that conversation. So next time someone says that to you, like, I look horrible today or my hair looks bad or I feel fat today, whatever it is. What happens if we shift that and say, you know what, I actually feel really good today. Like, I look good in my jeans, and I feel strong, and I feel healthy. What happens when you shift it to something positive? What often happens is people don't know what to say. (laughs) I've done it some, and people sometimes are thrown off guard, and they'll sometimes walk away, especially if it's a stranger. But but with my friends here in Austin, you know, I'll hang out, and I'll notice that conversation's happening. People are talking about the diets and how they need to lose weight. And I'll actually say, like, hey, guys, I have a book you can read. (laughs) I'm making it, and they're talking about my books, you know. And then they it, it kind of is an awareness where they start laughing and they're like, haha, but they, they cl- it clicks you out of that negativity. Yeah. So anything, you know, we can do, and you're so good at this, Susan. I mean, when you walk in a room, you like, you light it up and Aww. people listen to you, but you, I would love to see you doing it. Like when people start telling you how bad they look, I mean, I would love, you could pull it off so easily. You'd be like, well, you know what? I feel really I have one that I say, I always say, I really you like my it. wrists. I say that. I was like, I really like my wrists. They're very dainty. That's usually what I, I like say. I like my wrists too. <laughs> Yeah, see, I mean, that's, you know, focus on the positive, shift it. I mean, all of us can do little things every day to shift it. Yeah. It's kind of fun. It can almost be a game, you know, to to really try to be positive. And, and it, it helps. I mean, positivity spreads, just like you know, we know negativity spreads, you know. Why do you think uh, we as a culture are heading into a what would be considered a more dangerous uh, obesity epidemic? What do you think is going on there? Well, that's, you know, that's a great question. That's actually something we talk about a lot in our field is some of the, some of the efforts to combat obesity actually, in some people can trigger eating disorders. So we're, while there, it truly is, you know, there's really real reasons for people to educate about, you know, more balanced eating and you know, of course, we need to get out and move. When you and I grew up, you know, we would go out and we played outside. We didn't sit in front of video games all the time, even though we did have Nintendo after a while. <laughs> and I did play that, but still we played outside. So, I mean, we, yes, as a society, we need to get more active. We need to eat in a more balanced way, right? And not always eating the fast food. That doesn't mean McDonald's is bad. Actually, in my recovery, I had to, I had to eat at McDonald's as a goal. That was actually like a recovery goal. Wow. Again, it's all about balance. But so what I think as a society, what we need to really be careful about as we're encouraging people to move more and eat in a more balanced way is be careful with how we package that message. Because mm. how for some kids, that message in schools, that message is don't become obese. If you become, you know, if you become obese, it's the worst thing. They terrify these kids. And then some of these kids have, have the temperament that I did. It actually can trigger eating disorders. So these efforts to combat obesity can actually trigger eating disorders. And we have to be careful too. You know, some of my friends work in the health at every size movement and and they talk about how people can be healthy at all different weights. That's yeah. true too. You know, there's a lot there's a lot of things that the society doesn't talk about. Like the people who are healthy at a larger size. Yes. For some people that's actually where you're supposed to be. That's yeah. the, your genetic makeup. And why do we tell people that you you can't be that way if if you actually are healthy at a larger size. So there's all kinds of components that I think need to be pulled into the conversation about obesity that we don't talk about a lot. We we tend to, you know, as a society, we focus on narrow little pieces. I would like us to widen our gaze on that one. Yeah. Really widen the gaze about, you know, who are we talking to and how can we package a message that's actually going to be helpful for the most people. Yeah. Why it's do you- a tough it's tough why do you think it is that, um, I mean, I have my own theories, but you know, I, I'm curious to know what you think, you know, the pro, what's called pro Anna sites. Oh, yes. And uh, Anna standing for, you know, anorexia. And it's these, these websites and Instagram accounts that, that feed in for, pardon the pun, but feed into the ideology that being a skeleton is the best what look and all that stuff. Why? How do you combat that as you're trying to to help people overcome these eating disorders? What do you do about things like that that are out there and so prevalent? Well, that's that's a, that's a tough one. And actually, I mean, we eating disorder organizations have worked with with some different internet companies to shut down some of those sites. So one thing is actually working 
to shut those sites down. Now, of course, you know, we can't completely do that, right? No matter how much we try, Mm -hmm. but really putting the other side out there. So I feel like the body positive movement, especially on Instagram right now, the hashtag BOPO, (laughs) B-O-P-O, that I feel like that's one way, you know, to combat it, but really teaching people, you know, it's hard if, if you're in recovery for an eating disorder right now and you find yourself navigating to those sites, what can you do in your life to, to get off of that site and to head on to a more positive one? You know, what can you do to listen to podcasts like this? I mean, each person, we get those people who are drawn to those sites. What can you do to notice that? And it's again, it's like it's like the addiction. You feel pulled there. You have to have the drink. You have to binge. But you don't have to go to that site. Your hand doesn't have to click there. How can you click instead on like Hey Human podcast? You know, <laughs> how can you listen to that instead or go to a healthy website? Like you know, my website JennySchaefer.com has a lot of resources. EatingRecovery.com. Go to our Facebook pages, our Instagram pages. They're positive. But so I really think it's a personal choice. I mean, it comes down to. We have to take accountability for our own behaviors, our own actions. People don't choose eating disorders, but they do choose recovery. Yeah. And once you have awareness, we really need to make those choices to be positive. And if no one's going to those sites, those sites are going to shut down eventually. Yeah. You know, but but we unfortunately there's too many people still going to those sites. I mean, I even accidentally will stumble upon them and yeah. I or they'll try to friend me or whatever, and it's 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 a it's it's really hard. It makes me sad because the people on those sites they're they're just really sick. Yeah. I mean, they're 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 sick people and they need help. And, yeah. you know, I've seen some of those people actually get treatment, and get better, which has been cool. <laughs> and then they start positive sites. So I think it's really interesting yeah, that you use the, the metaphor, or the uh, anthropomorphizing the eating disorder as Ed, as being an actual person, because I feel like that would, it gives you a, an enemy. It gives you the thing that you can fight. It's this person, Ed, that's, you know, instead yeah. of this sort of, you know, out there in the ether, eating disorder, what does that mean? You're, here's this, an actual villain that you can yeah. kick to the curb. And you actually nailed it. I mean, for me, especially in early recovery, that was key. I thought my eating disorder was who I was. So naming it Ed, and I actually would put it in a chair in therapy, a different chair than me, you know, and talking to it was it taught me that I am not my eating disorder. I am my own unique thoughts. I have my own personality and I can fight against this. And it also helps families a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, families can get so tied up in fighting against the person with the eating disorder. You know, why can't you just eat or Mm -hmm. just stop binging? But the truth is we need to be directing our anger to Ed, whether it's the family member or the person suffering. Don't get mad at the patient get mad at the disorder. You know, we don't get, if someone has cancer, we don't blame them for that. And we don't say, why don't you just stop having cancer? You know, and and it's the same thing with eating disorders. It's not, why don't you just eat? It's like, if they could just eat, they would trust me. You know, it's a brain disorder. It's actually biopsychosocial. You know, there's truly stuff going on in the brain. You can't just eat, but you can choose to get better by, you know, going to therapy, going to positive you know, both positive sites like yours and you're doing stuff and it's a hard, it's a long road, but it's, it's totally doable. But yeah, Ed, that was a, that was a really helpful for me, especially in the beginning. I like to call it, was kind of training wheels. I don't, I, in the end, I didn't call my eating disorder Ed anymore. In fact, it just kind of, it was like a muscle. I stopped engaging it. It, it kind of withered away. I had, a, you remember when I broke my foot and <laughs> I had the pink cast on yeah. back in Nashville. When I took that cast off, I had, my leg had withered away. There was no muscle. And that's essentially what happened to my eating disorder muscle. You know, it's a muscle. As long as you're engaging it and listening to it, yeah. it gets bigger. But if you stop engaging it and start ignoring it, as much you can, it, it withers away just like any muscle that doesn't get used. And so eventually I just stopped talking to Ed. But I, I still don't think I would date a guy named Ed. I think that'd be weird. <laughs> I actually have had friends that are people, it's funny, readers read my book whose husbands have been named Ed. <laughs> and they'd say like, yeah, I had the book like sitting on my coffee table and my husband came home and he was like, huh, I'm a little concerned, Life Without Ed. That's, that's my name. Funny. But, and those I, are true stories. I'm excited but, about your new book. Do you know, do you have a timeline or just? Well, I'm hoping, um, I need accountability here um i'm hoping to i still struggle with perfectionism so i'm like i'll start the book when it's going to be perfect but it's not going to be perfect so start now um i've started a lot i've done a lot of brainstorming a lot of work but I, my goal is to get a book deal hopefully in the next few months and then hopefully maybe i mean i don't think it would be out till like 2018 maybe even 19 for sure definitely not this year but stay tuned and maybe when it's out we could do another podcast oh that'd be fantastic that'd Absolutely. be awesome that's its, You'll its own, have... i'd say that's its own topic pt PTSD, of course, and even though oh, yeah, it's all it's intro-related, 
Yeah. I mean, for sure. There's a, there's a big crossover with eating disorders and PTSD. That's a whole topic I've been doing. And then there's also just PTSD by itself. Right. I mean, and, and one of these days I need to write a book about anxiety because I've actually noticed, you know, that's what fueled my eating disorder. And that's also what fueled my PTSD. And until I can really conquer anxiety, I'm afraid I'm going to keep developing different mental illnesses. So yeah. I need to, my goal is not to keep, you know, I don't want to keep writing books about mental illnesses. Yeah. I want my, some of my friends are like, why don't you just write a book about being happy? <laughs> like, I will once I, I get through all this stuff, but, um, yeah. but I'm grateful. I'm ha- I am happy. I'm, I'm actually really happy today. I'm, I found my life again after eating disorder, after PTSD. I feel so grateful. You helped me. I mean, more than you even know. Like, you just were always such a grounded, balanced person. And such a, in Nashville, you know, just a positive light. You're such a positive person. Anytime I got to see you, even if it wasn't that often, you don't even know what that helped, how that helped me. Thank you. That that means a lot to me. You do that a lot. You do that for for a lot of people. I mean, you really do. I wish people on the podcast could, like, see your glow. (laughs) (laughs) They can probably feel it, though. But but you you have a light. You are a shining light for sure. So one day, maybe you should move to a TV show or a Facebook live. Oh, I mean, if somebody would give me a show, that would be so incredible. I would love that. If TV is part of people. You never know where the the roads may go. Jenny... Shaper, thank you. I'm going to put links like crazy on the heyhumanpodcast.com so people can find you. And you're doing incredible work. And I I mean, the countless humans that you have helped. Oh, just, I love the human it's, thing. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I, I love really you. Love- and I'm just proud of you. And I think you're amazing. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for your podcast. I love the Hey Human name. I think that really just. You know, and, and not just, hey, woman, hey, man. It's like, hey, human. We're all just humans, and it's yeah. beautiful. So I'm going to – I think everybody, you guys should rate her podcast, give it the best uh, ratings. <laughs> she, I know she needs good more ratings. Yes. And, and, yeah, and thanks for putting um, links and write reviews for your podcast too. And also I was going to tell you, I'll give you a link, Susan, but – at Eating Recovery Center, we're, we're about to release a podcast called Mental Note Podcast. Great. So the website for that's mentalnotepodcast.com. I'll but, put that on there too. Yeah. So we're, I think a lot of people are jumping into the podcast world. But um, yeah. So stay tuned on that. But I would love to be on your show again. Yes, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an avid. An open... I'm, subs- I'm subscribed to your show now. I'm yeah. excited. It's Wait, really great. Thank you. I, it's really great. You I'm have an open be- invitation, and I'm going to come visit you in Austin, too. Oh, calm down. Yeah. We have lots to do here in the summertime. Bring your swimsuit. <laughs> I, oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. I love you. I love you, girl. Thank so good you. To see you. Bye. All right. Bye. Have a good weekend. You, too.